most important verse in the Bible. Now, people have been guessing for weeks or months what that verse is. I've heard a rumor that some Sunday school classes actually have betting pools. Uh, surely not for money, not here. But uh, they uh, are trying to guess what the verse is. Now, admittedly, a pastor's setting himself up for trouble when he announces he's going to talk about the most important verse in the Bible because everybody has a different idea of what that verse should be. Maybe for you, the most important verse in the Bible is one you memorized as a child. Maybe it's one that your mom or dad taught to you. For others of you, it may be a verse that helped you through a particularly difficult time in your life. But I think you would agree with me that if you had to select the single most important verse in the Bible, it ought to be one that answers the most important question in life. And that is, how can a person have a right relationship with God? That's the question, by the way, Job asked thousands of years ago in Job 9-2. How can a man be right with God? The answer to that question not only affects your life now, but if there really is a God, the answer to that question affects your eternity so where do we go to find the answer to that question? How can a person have a right relationship with God? How can he know for sure his sins are forgiven and that he will be welcomed rather than turned away from heaven? Today, we're going to look at the verse of Scripture. It's actually one sentence that I think most clearly answers that question and it's found in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 5. Turn there, if you would, as we discover the most important verse in the Bible. Now, for those of you who may not know about the letter to the Romans, the apostle Paul wrote it to a group of Jewish and Gentile believers. And the theme of the book of Romans is that the righteousness of God, that word righteousness simply means a right standing with God, is available to anyone who trusts in Christ for his salvation. In fact, the theme verses are chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, for as it says, the just shall live by faith. In the first three chapters of the book of Romans, Paul explains how nobody is in a right standing with God. There's not one righteous person among us, no, not even one. You say, why not? Wait a minute, I'm not sure I believe that. I mean, what about the pagan who has never heard the name of Jesus Christ? Surely he gets a pass and is allowed into heaven. No, Paul says, not the pagan. He is condemned by God. Well, then surely the moralist, the person who lives by a good moral code, lives by the golden rule, he's exempt from hell. He gets into heaven, doesn't he? He says, no, the moralist is condemned. Well, what about the sincere follower of religion? What about a religious person? He's allowed into heaven, isn't he? Paul says, no, not the religious person. There is none righteous among us. In Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, if religion won't do it, if morality won't get you into heaven, if ignorance is not an excuse, then how do we have a right relationship with God? And that brings us to Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Paul says, but to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned, it is counted as righteousness. And what I want you to notice in this simple sentence are three characteristics of the person who is in a right standing with God. And what's interesting is these three characteristics are completely contrary to our human reasoning. They turn our expectations upside down because they're God's wisdom and not man's wisdom. 
Will you notice what those three characteristics are? First of all, whom does God forgive? Who is assured of heaven? First of all, God forgives those who admit they are ungodly. Look at verse 5 again. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, and underline this, who justifies the ungodly. That word justify simply means, it's a legal term that means to declare not guilty. Imagine a judge in his robe taking that gavel and pounding it and declaring not guilty. The Bible says the people whom God declares not guilty are the who? The ungodly. Now, if you ask the average person on the street, who do you think is going to be in heaven? They say, well, people, you know, who go to church. People who read the Bible, people who do nice things for little old women, you know, that, that's who gets to go to heaven, right? No. He says it's not the godly, it is the ungodly. The King James Version says the wicked. The wicked. Those are the ones God forgives. What does that mean, ungodly? You know that little prefix, un, U-N, it can mean not whatever. We say somebody is unfriendly, it means they're not friendly. We say somebody is unloving, they're not loving. We say somebody is ungodly, we mean they're not godlike. And we all don't have a problem accepting that. We know we're not like God. God is infinite, we're finite. God is all powerful, we're weak. God is all wise, we're not all wise. We understand that we are not like God, but that prefix un also means something else. It means opposed to. When we say somebody is un-American, we don't mean they're not like an American. We mean they are opposed to the values and ideals that our country was founded on. Remember decades ago, the House had a House subcommittee on what? Un-American activities. They were trying to ferret out people in our country who were opposed to the basic principles of our country. When Paul says the ungodly, he's talking about people who are opposed to God. And guess who that is? Every one of us. We are born with an inclination to oppose God. We are born with this inclination. When God says yes, our first inclination is to say no. When God says no to something, our first inclination is to say yes. And we've all inherited that sin tendency. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned. Not just some have sinned. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, you know, we, we don't understand that. We like to point to people who are worse than we are. To measure our morality by them. We compare ourselves to other people. But God sees no difference in humanity. We are all on the same plane. There is no difference in God's eyes between the pastor and the prostitute. Between the governor and the gunman. Between the lawyer and the lawless. Between the sophisticate and the savage. We are all sinners who need a savior. And the first step to being forgiven is to recognize, to admit that we are ungodly. But to the one who does not work, but who justifies the ungodly. The second characteristic I want you to notice here is that God forgives those who realize they are incapable of earning salvation. Notice in verse 5 again, to the one who does not work. God forgives those who refuse to work for their salvation. Now again, that turns our expectations topsy-turvy. We think just the opposite. In fact, we're taught from early in life that any good thing that comes into our life is because of our hard work. You say, well, pastor, why is it that God doesn't allow us to work, to earn his forgiveness? Well, Paul explains that in verse 4, the verse before verse 5. Paul says, now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. When he uses that word wage, you understand what he's talking about. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, 
when you get your check on the 15th and or 30th of every month, how many of you go into your employer and say, thank you so much for this. I can't believe you would do such a thing. I wasn't expecting this. Thank you so much. What can I ever do to repay you? Anybody ever do that? Sometimes I wish the staff did come in and do that, but they don't. <laughs> Why? Because what they receive is not a gift. It's not a favor. It is an obligation. You have an obligation. Your employer has an obligation with you. You've made a deal with him. You work, and he pays you for what you do. It's not a gift from him. It is a wage. It is what you are owed. And ladies and gentlemen, if we work for our salvation, then salvation is not a gift from God. It is what God owes us. And God refuses to owe any man or woman salvation. Now, some people say, well, I can accept that most of the way, but surely we play a little bit of a part in it. Maybe our salvation is 90% what Jesus did for us on the cross and dying for our sins, but it's 10% my effort. Maybe it's faith in Christ plus getting baptized that gets me into heaven. Or maybe it's trusting in Jesus and giving to the church. Or maybe it's trusting in Christ and keeping the Ten Commandments. It's God and me together. No, because even if salvation is 10% or 1% what we do, it changes the whole nature of a gift and makes it an obligation. And that's why the Bible says God doesn't allow us to do anything to earn our salvation. It is those who do not work who earn eternal life. That is what the Bible says to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. Whom does God forgive? Who can be assured that they're going to be welcomed into heaven one day? First of all, those who admit that they are ungodly and need God's forgiveness. Secondly, those who realize they are incapable of earning in any way their salvation. And then finally, and this is key, God forgives those who trust in Christ to save them. Look again at verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, underline that, believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. Earlier in chapter, Paul, uh, chapter 4, Paul has been explaining to this mainly Jewish audience how salvation is God's gift. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. And as exhibit A of that truth, he uses Abraham as an example. Now, you have to understand, to a Jewish audience, Abraham was kind of like George Washington is to Americans. He was the father of the country, the father of the Jewish people. He was the most revered character in Jewish history, Abraham. And the Jews thought if any man could be in heaven because of his good works, it was Abraham. I mean, just think about what he did. God told him to go to a country, leave everything familiar to the country he would show them. And he picked up and he went there. Uh, he, when he got into a dis dispute with his nephew Lot over who could have the best land, he voluntarily gave the best land to his nephew Lot. When God asked his, uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son, his beloved son Isaac, he was willing to do that. There is one guy who certainly could inherit heaven based on his works, couldn't he? Not according to what Paul says. Look in verse 3 of Romans 4. He says, for what does the scripture say? And Abraham believed God and it that belief that faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness a right standing with God the event that Paul is referring to goes back to Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 remember before Abraham had done anything good before he had become circumcised which would be like us being baptized today before any good thing Abraham did God said to Abraham Abraham I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. Me? I'm 75 years old. I can't be the father of one, much less a multitude. He said, Abraham, go outside. Look into the stars, at the heavens, and count the number of stars. Can you count them? No. He said, so shall your descendants be. And then, Genesis 15, 6 says, and Abraham believed God. 
And God took that belief of Abraham and in the great accounting room of heaven, that faith of Abraham was exchanged for God's righteousness. At that moment, Abraham was declared not guilty. He was in a right standing with God. And Paul uses that same word, believe, to describe how we're in a right relationship with God. The word believe doesn't just mean intellectual assent to a set of facts. It is a belief that means to trust in, to cling to, to put your full hope in. It's the kind of faith that motivates you to do something. Abraham, yes, he believed what God said, but he believed it so much that he uprooted his family and left everything familiar to that land that God would show him without knowing where he was going. It was the kind of faith Noah exercised when God said to Noah, I'm going to destroy the world with a flood. I want you to make an ark for you and your family. He didn't just believe intellectually the world was going to be destroyed. He believed enough that he was willing to build an ark and be called a fool for doing so and putting his family into that boat. And it's the same thing with us. To believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation doesn't mean just to believe intellectual facts about Jesus. It means to believe, to cling to, to trust in what Jesus said about himself, that he came and died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. It means to trust in that and that alone for our salvation. Perhaps this illustration will help you even more understand what biblical belief is. Some of our folks have seen this before, but it so well illustrates what the Bible means when it says believe. Believe isn't just a set of intellectual facts you agree to. You know, I could believe that this chair is sturdy, that it is well-made, that it is capable of supporting my weight. I believe that intellectually. Is this chair supporting me? No. Intellectual assent is not enough. I could say, well, I kind of believe that this chair can hold me, but I want to hedge my bets. And so I sit down, but I also put some weight on my feet. I don't want to put my whole weight on it because this thing could break. Is it really holding me? No, it's my feet as well as the chair. To really believe in this chair means I put my full weight in this chair. No weight in my feet. I transfer the responsibility from my feet completely to the chair to support me. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is the same way with believing in Jesus Christ. To believe in Jesus Christ doesn't mean to believe certain historical facts about Jesus. You can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You can believe that he died for the sins of the world. You can believe that he rose from the dead on the third day and still split hell wide open when you die. Did you know that? How do I know that? Because you know the demons and Satan believe all of those things about Jesus. They believe that he was the son of God. When the demons confronted Jesus, they said to him, why are you here, O son of God? They understood who Jesus was. They believed that he died for the sins of the world. They believed that he rose again from the dead. In fact, they believe those things more than you do. More than I do. Because they were there. They were eyewitnesses to those things. But that kind of belief is not what saves you. It is when you are willing to appropriate that faith in your own life. When you come to that point of desperation, when you believe that Jesus is your only hope of heaven, when you kneel before a holy God and you say, God, I know I am ungodly. I know I have sinned. I know I deserve your eternal punishment. But I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me to take the punishment on the cross that I deserve to take from you. And right now, I'm trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone, not my good works, but in Jesus and Jesus alone to save me from my sins. And the Bible says the moment, the instant you say that to God, just like Abraham, God takes your faith no matter how small it is. And in the great accounting room of heaven, God exchanges your little bit of faith for his everlasting forgiveness and righteousness. To the one who does not work, 
but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. As a young girl, Charlotte Elliott had heard that truth all of her life. One day when she was nine years old, her village pastor came by to see her. He said, Charlotte, are you ready to come to Jesus today? She said, Pastor, I'd like to, but I don't know how to come. He said, just come the way you are. And that night, little Charlotte Elliott knelt beside her bed and she prayed this prayer. Dear God, my pastor said, I don't have to wait any longer to come to you. If you will take me just the way I am, I'll come to you now. Years later, as an adult, Charlotte Elliott used that experience to pen one of the most loved hymns of all time. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. As a little girl, Charlotte Elliott understood a truth so simple that wise men have stumbled over it. And that truth is this. To the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, who does not work, but believes in him who forgives, justifies the ungodly, God takes his faith and counts it as righteousness. Righteousness. 